in the first beginning, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the Professor uh, James Seward. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm P.Y. Uh, Pang Yun Chou, the organizer of the ICC. Uh, good morning and a good evening. Dr. James Seward uh, completed his plastic surgery residency at uh, the North Western Deaneries uh, United Kingdom and uh, completed his craniofacial surgery fellowship at the UT Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, currently, he is the associate professor of the plastic surgery at the UT Southwestern uh, Medical Centers and focuses on the care for patients with the craniofacial congenital anomalies. Uh, clinically, James is specializing in cleft lip and the palate, cleft palate related speech problems and the vascular anomalies. Professor Seward has won the best doctors of the pediatric plastic surgeon in Dallas D magazine four years in a row. Academically, James has been principal investigators in several CLEP pilot management in the CLEP speech evaluation project in UT Southwestern. Also, he has numerous peer reviews, original articles of CLEP care. Today, we are so honored to have Professor Seward to come share the topic CLEP palatoplasty. And uh, this presentation will be paneled by four Chang'an craniofacial faculties, including Professor Ben Lai, Professor Fei Huan, Professor Frank Chan, and uh, Tin Chen. And so today, the presentation will be moderated by myself and uh, Dr. Junior Tu. So let's welcome Professor C with presentation. Please, James. Well, thank you for the introduction. It's, it's my honor to be here tonight. Um, let me get my screen sharing and, and we'll get started. Yes, can wait. All right, can you everyone see that? Hopefully, yes. Sure, sure. Okay, great. Well, I have no disclosures. Um, and I'm, as you said, I'm a pediatric plastic and cleft surgeon here at Children's Medical Center in UT Southwestern in Dallas. And it's my honor to talk to you tonight about cleft palate repair. So why do we repair a cleft of the palate? Well, the palate has two main functions, to act as a barrier between the mouth and nose so that what we eat and drink doesn't come out of our nose and to block airflow out of our noses when we talk. So the inability to separate the mouth from the nose has effects right from birth as it can interfere with feeding. Babies feed by generating negative pressure in the mouth um, and by compressing the nipple against the top of the mouth. And when you have a cleft, you try and generate negative pressure, but air rushes in through the nose and eliminates that negative pressure. So children born with a cleft can feed, but most will need to use a cleft feeding system. So these look like regular bottles, but they incorporate a valve system into the nipple so that when the baby compresses the nipple with the tongue, milk can pass into the mouth without the need for suction. Um, so here's the difference. On the left is a regular bottle. You can see that squeezing the nipple makes very little difference. But with the cleft feeding system, the same action of squeezing the nipple with the tongue forces milk into the mouth and allows the baby to feed. So a year or so later, speech is developing. And when we talk, air comes out of our lungs, resonates in the throat and comes up into the pharynx. There we need to control whether air escapes through the nose or whether the nasal passage is blocked off and pressure develops in the mouth where the airflow can be shaped by the lips, the tongue and teeth into the sounds we recognize as speech. The mechanism for blocking off the nasal airflow is known as the velopharyngeal mechanism and involves the palate lifting up and back to touch against the posterior pharyngeal wall. These are the consonant and vowel sounds that we can make as humans. And these are the sounds that we can make without an effective velopharyngeal mechanism. So this is the main reason we repair the cleft palate, to give the child the full repertoire of sounds they're able to make. So the palate is a sandwich, it's with the outside layers being the oral 
nasal and nasal mucosa, and the inside being filling. And in the hard palate, that filling is bone. Um, and in the soft filling, or soft palate, that filling is muscle. So let's think about the soft palate muscle. So this is a diagram from the back left of the palate with the hard palate furthest away from us. This area represents the soft palate. And you can see the paired muscles labeled A, C, D, and E crossing the midline of the palate and meeting up with their neighbor on the other side. There are two muscles that come from the back of the tongue or throat. The palatopharyngeus, marked D, and the palatoglossus, marked E. And you can see these muscles if you look at the back of the mouth as the two folds of tissue either side of the tonsils. The anterior tonsillar pillar is the palatoglossus, and the posterior tonsillar pillar is the palatopharyngeus. There are also two pairs of muscles that descend from the base of the skull. The tensor villi palatini, which tightens and flattens the front of the palate, marked C, and the levator villi palatini, which elevates and pulls the muscle, the palate backwards, marked A. While all of these muscles work together in a complex way, it's the action of levator that has the most effect in achieving velopharyngeal closure by pulling the soft palate up and back to contact the posterior pharyngeal wall. Lastly, there is a muscle which doesn't have a pair, the muscularis uvulae, marked B. This muscle sits along the midline of the soft palate and acts to straighten the palate as it lifts. But in the cleft palate, there is a gap in the midline, so that sling of paired muscles can't form. And so the muscles tend to insert abnormally anteriorly. During the palate repair, these muscles are identified, dissected free, and reconstructed in the posterior palate, attempting as far as possible to recreate that normal anatomical muscular sling. So let's talk about palate repair techniques. So I like to separate in these in my mind into hard palate techniques and soft palate techniques, because any of the hard palate procedures can be used with any of the soft palate procedures. So first let's talk about the hard palate operations. So this is the most popular technique for repairing the hard palate in the US at the moment, the Bardak two flap. If you look at the top left, the palate is incised along the cleft edge between the palate and the alveolus and at the front of the palate, joining the two incisions. The palate is elevated away from the underlying bone from front to back giving excellent visualization of the greater palatine vessels passing through the greater palatine foramen. The flaps are moved towards the midline and repaired to one another and to the alveolus at the front of the palate, leaving some gaps of exposed bone at the sides, which will heal up over a couple of weeks. The bardak, as we said, has three main incisions, the medial, the lateral, and the anterior. The other hard palate techniques just eliminate one or more of these incisions. So if we don't make the anterior incision, we have the von Langenbeck technique. This medializes the palate mucoperiosteum as bipedicled flaps, but doesn't leave exposed bone or scar anteriorly. And the summerlad or medial approach technique, which eliminates the need for both the anterior and the lateral incisions, but it's only appropriate for relatively narrow clefts. So it kind of makes sense for cleft of the palate in isolation that you don't need the anterior incision. And for clefts of the lip and palate where the anterior palate is involved in the cleft that you do need the anterior incision to repair the palate at the front. So a technique to get around that need and to repair the anterior palate ahead of time is to combine the lip repair with a Voma flap. So this technique was described by the Oslo group led by Abby Holm, but was popularized at least in the UK by Summerlad. Um, and on the left is a patient at the time of the lip repair. And on the right is the same patient when returning for the palate repair six months later. And you can see how the anterior hard palate is already closed and effectively it's turned that complete cleft of the anterior palate into an incomplete cleft of the palate. So these are intraoperative pictures. And so anterior is at the bottom of the screen and posterior is at the top, but you can see the two incisions marked. 
the first at the medial edge of the palatine shelf on the cleft side, and the second anteriorly at the junction of the pink oral mucosa and the red nasal mucosa, and posteriorly along the edge of the vomer on the non-cleft side. This incision extends to the back of the vomer where the adenoids start, and they make a back cut at this point to allow the flap to turn over and reach the cleft side. So to inset the flap, it's laid under the mucoperiosteum of the palatal shelf and it's sutured in a vest over, vest over pants technique. Closing the flap edge to edge with simple sutures is certainly easier, but in my experience, it leads to more fistulae, which defeats the purpose of doing it. So I find this technique helpful to reduce the number of Bardak and von Langbeck style palate repairs that I have to do. Um, and when possible, I always will just do that medial approach to the palate. Um, because the anterior hard palate is already repaired at the time of the palatoplasty. So let's talk about soft palate techniques. Um, these two individuals were kind of key during the 1990s in describing, you know, the radical intravelar veloplasty. On the left is core cutting, and on the right is Brian Summerlad. And, you know, having done most of my training in the UK, I'm kind of strongly influenced in my choice of techniques by Brian Summerlad. And so this is one of his repairs. So again, the front of the palette is at the bottom of the screen, the back of the palette is at the top. Um, and you know, at this point, the mucous glands are separated off the muscle, the muscle is repaired in the midline or together with the nasal layer of the palate. Um, you can see that pinked rib appearance of the soft palate muscles. Um, and his intravelar he dissects, you know, using the knife, using the microscope to find that nasal layer and um, retropositions the muscles, reconstructing that levator sling at the back of the palate. <clears throat> and you can see the bare nasal mucosa where the muscle was abnormally located towards the front of the soft palate. Um, this, as you may know, is Leonard Furlow. Um, he described his technique of the double opposing z plasty, which has really become very, very popular and with good reason. So you can see that, you know, it is, as we said, a double opposing z plasty. You make a z plasty on the oral side, and then the z plasty on the nasal side is in the opposite direction. The advantage of this is that you carry the muscles of the palate in your posteriorly based flap so that um, they can overlap one another, they can lie kind of transversely towards the back of the palate. Um, as I said, this is a very popular technique and almost everyone nowadays will do a modification of the furlough palatoplasty. Um, you know, one of the, the most commonly described is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia modification where the furlough is combined with relaxing incisions um, to allow it to repair wider clefts. You know, one of the, the concerns that I have with, with the furlough is that it's great for very narrow clefts. It's great for, you know, isolated clefts of the soft palate, but it is a Z-plasty. So it works on the principles of lateral laxity, giving you AP lengthening. Um, when you have a wide cleft, you get to the point where you really don't have that lateral laxity. And so you need to combine it with a modification or a different technique to allow that type of repair. Um, other modifications that have been described are the, the change of angle with Akron Children's Hospital. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, the, the furlough has, has been kind of um, towards the hamulus on each side. Um, and they modified it to, to provide a narrower angle um, in the, the posterior based flap and a wider angle in the, the anterior based flap. Um, obviously, this, this group here with Dr. Lowe um, talked about the small double opposing Z-plasty. So you, you, you're eliminating some of the need of that lateral laxity um, while still giving you know, an adequate muscle repositioning um, uh, allowing this technique to be used in more circumstances. Um, Joe Losey in Pittsburgh uh, has incorporated alloderm into a lot of his repairs. So one of the problems with the double opposing Z-plasty is that often that anteriorly mucosa-only flap 
on the nasal side doesn't always reach into where it needs to along along that you know hard palate cleft margin and so often you are left with a little hole um Typically, I don't do very much with that little hole. As long as it's small, I consider it a drainage hole and la allow it to heal. But, you know, he's, he's described using alloderm to, to cover that, to create a patch and to, to get that complete healing in that, in that place. Um, Albert Wu, who was in St. Louis when he described this, um, talked about his modification. And so you know, he does two main things. Firstly, he only does an oral z -plasty. he repairs the nasal side in a straight line. And the other thing he does is he does this complete dissection around the levator. You can see in this picture that he's got this tubular levator without any other muscles attached um, that, is, that can, you know, is the whole of his muscle repair for his, his palate. I've also done my modification of the furlough. Now, you know, I don't have great pictures of this because I haven't published it yet. I'm still collecting data. But you can see my markings, you know, they're, they're, I think they're fairly traditional. I do make the anterior angle a little bit more acute than the posterior angle, um, but not nearly to the, the, the extent of the Akron group. But, you know, I grew up with the Summerlad school of thinking about palate surgery. And, you know, the main objection to the furlough is that it doesn't repair the muscles anatomically, that you end up with the sandwich of levator and then you know, palatopharyngeus, and then on the other side, levator and palatopharyngeus, and you often see asymmetric movement and asymmetric lift um, in the palate after a furlough. And so really my modification is um, that I do a Summerlad style muscle repair with the furlough pattern of incisions. And so um, you can see here, this is kind of the nasal myomucosal flap. You can see levator is identified you know, within the little oval, and you can see the incision along that, that margin as this flap is gonna come across. And what I found is that, you know, if, if you just keep the, the muscles attached to the nasal mucosa, then you end up repairing the muscles immediately behind the transverse incision. Um, and anatomically in a non-cleft situation, the muscles are a little bit further back than that. They're really at the junction of the anterior two thirds and posterior third. Um, and so what I will do is after I've, I've brought that flap across is I will just dissect under that muscle to allow it to move, you know, five millimeters or so further back so that it more reflects that natural position of two thirds of the way back along the palate instead of immediately behind that transverse suture line. And then we should talk about kind of adjuncts to palate repair. And, and these are Kind of really big adjuncts so maybe that's not the right word but the first person i'd like to talk about when thinking about these adjuncts is bob man so bob man recently retired he's up in michigan um, and he really popularized the use of buckle flaps um, so buckle um, myomucosal flaps in primary palate repair so i'd like to talk about kind of my experience that brought me to using buckle flaps in certain situations. So I was faced with this palate to repair. This is a kid with sickler syndrome. And this was early in my career before I had thought about buckle flaps, before I thought about kind of the newer modifications. And so I did this in a traditional way. I, you know, I, I made extensive undermining of the mucoperiosteum. I made relaxing incisions. I medialized everything, brought the palate together in the midline. And Unsurprisingly, it didn't heal great. I got a big fistula and I went back in to repair the fistula and it's healed, but the kid has ended up with a relatively short palate with a lot of scarring and then needed another surgery for, for velopharyngeal dysfunction. And so, you know, here we are kind of three surgeries later with a scarred palate and not the best solution. Um, and so contrast that with this child whose palate repair, whose palate I repaired with buckle flaps. And so you can see that in this case, I used both buckle flaps on the oral side and I closed the nasal side with bilateral vomo flaps. But I, on the oral side, I used one flap anteriorly um, and I used the second one across the midline at the hard soft junction. And this is the same kid a year later. You can see how the palate looks completely different from that first patient. 
Um, it's soft and supple rather than hard and scarred. And you can see the outline of the flaps, which have grown substantially, allowing the palette to remain long and mobile. Um, her occlusion is great and she's doing really well. Her speech is, is good too. Um, now, obviously I used both of those flaps in that circumstance on the oral side, but that's not typically how Bob Mann will do it. He will typically use one flap on the oral side and one flap on the nasal side and combine that with a double opposing Z-plasty or a modification, again, of a double opposing Z-plasty. So, so this is kind of just one of his patterns. This is the, the man pattern number two, which is his most commonly used one. And you can see that he starts with what looks like a double opposing Z-plasty, um, but there is one big difference. And the difference is right here. You can see that when he makes the incision of the mucosal only flap on the nasal side, it is also posteriorly based, whereas typically it would be anteriorly based. What that does is it, is it brings the palate, it brings both sides of the palate back um, so that the buccal flap on the nasal side can lie transversely instead of having to kind of navigate its way around a Z-plasty. Um, and then the oral layer is closed, you know, as a typical Z-plasty using the, the second buccal flap anteriorly in the midline. So I don't think any discussion of modern palatoplasty is really complete without mentioning the use of buccal fat. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't made the leap towards buccal fat myself, but, you know, researching it for this talk, it, it seems pretty encouraging. So it was kind of first introduced in 1995. And it's been used for a few different reasons. So it's been used um, to line the exposed bone lateral to the Bardak flaps to minimize scarring of the denuded bone and to help with maxillary growth. Um, it's been used to reinforce the hard soft junction to minimize fistulae at the hard soft junction. So brought transversely across. And then of course, kind of this group, and I've seen both of these authors in the audience today, um, have described using the buccal flap for both purposes. So splitting the buccal flap, buccal fat, and using you know, the posterior side to reinforce the hard soft junction and the anterior side to line that um, exposed bone dead space. And even more extensively, you know, lining really the whole of the, the hard palate, um, <clears throat> again, to, to minimize problems with maxillary growth and to minimize problems with fistulae. Um, it's also been used to help with situations where the Z-plasty flaps don't make it all the way over to the other side, like we were talking about with needing that lateral laxity. You know, sometimes you know, the tissues don't make it across all the way. And then you're, you're forced to make this decision about, do you leave a space? Do you do a kind of V to Y contracting the palate to get it closed? Um, or do you do this? Do you, do you fill that, that hole with buccal fat? just so that it can remucosalize and you can end up with, you know, the, the longest palate you can with um, the advantages of the Z-plasty in terms of length and breaking up scar. So how do we come to any conclusions about, you know, what we do with palate repair? Well, there are three main outcomes from palate repair. You know, you need to always think about, you know, speech outcomes, growth outcomes, and fistulae. Um, so all the papers I just described describe a 0% fistula rate. And so, you know, that, that sounds great from the point of view of the fistulae. Um, it has been noted not to adversely affect the shape of the cheek and cause, um, you know, facial deformities and irregular, irregularities because of the lack of that fat pad. Um, you know, our hosts here published this article describing good maxillary growth uh, following buccal fat-based palate repairs. And so growth, you know, at the moment seems to be encouraging. And you're know, looking at speech outcome, you know, obviously the, the published articles show that they're encouraging, but Jamie Perry, who does a lot of dynamic MRI, has started looking at outcomes in the palate um, following buccal fat. And obviously these are, these are small sample articles, but 
Um, what it shows, if you compare the, the BFP, which is buccal fat, versus a cleft repaired traditionally versus a non-cleft patient, um, you can see that the kids that were repaired with buccal fat, the palates are much more in keeping with a non-cleft situation than with a traditionally repaired cleft situation, both in terms of just the length of the soft palate and in terms of the ratio of the soft palate length to pharyngeal space length, which is basically a measure of, you know, is the palate long enough to make it up to the posterior nasopharynx and achieve that closure. So a couple of tips about the way that I do palate repairs. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm strongly influenced by Brian Summerlad. Um, and so I do all my dissection sharp with a 15 blade. Um, and you can see here where I'm just just coming off the, the back of the hard palate, I'm identifying the aponeurosis um, in, in the plane, and I'm I, opening up that plane between the mucous glands on the oral side and the muscle. So this is kind of at the end of that stage um, where I've swept the mucous glands away from the muscle, I've closed the nasal side of the palate. Um, you can see the mucous glands are elevated, you can see the aponeurosis and the muscle intact below that, and you know, these are the, the fibers of palatopharyngeus. Um, you, can gen you can tell that because if you gently pull them, you'll get some retraction of the posterior tonsillar pillar. Um, levator lies deep to these on the nasal side of the palate. Um, and so we need to kind of elevate that. And the way I do that is again, with a, with a 15 blade. So I grab the muscle bundle, I lift it away from myself, cutting through the muscle a few millimeters away from the suture line. So I go through that muscle and I look for the plane, which is a plexus of fine blood vessels over the nasal mucosa. And you can often see a blue hue when you're looking down the microscope in this layer. Um, and then I sweep this plane medial to lateral. When I have that plane, I cut through the aponeurosis anteriorly, close to the hard palate. And I develop that plane under the muscle more from anterior to posterior, again, just sweeping with the side of the knife. And here's a close up of that plane I was talking about. You can see the little plexus of fine blood vessels, which are intact, keeping the nasal mucosa alive. And then I continue to mobilize the muscle from the hamulus and from the nasal mucosa. I partially separate palatophangias from levator. Um, and you can just see levator coming into view now. Um, you can see it's clearly a separate muscle. You can see it's got a different color. It's got a different orientation of the fibers. And I don't release everything around it like the, the Albert Wu palatoplasty. I don't think you need to do that. I just release it enough that it has good excursion without a hard endpoint. I want to feel that all the kind of ligaments and fibrous tissue is released. Um, and you can see the position of the levator before and after and that free excursion of the muscle. So another tip that I got from Summerlad is to use an oral turndown flap um, at the front of the cleft to reinforce the hard soft junction. And so you're eliminating superimposed incisions in the oral and nasal mucosal layers. Um, and you know, Summerlad credits this triangular flap with a threefold reduction of his fistula rate after he started using it. Um, and I can use this triangle even in a complete cleft lip and palate because the anterior hard palate is repaired ahead of time, as we discussed previously. You know, the other thing that's not really often discussed is muscle tensioning. And so when you, when you do your intravelar veloplasty or you kind of do your double opposing Z-plasty and you're moving these levator muscles to the posterior palate, they're always too long. Um, and they can either be overlapped or they can be bunched in the middle. Um, you know, to, I like to bunch them. Um, that helps, I think, to create a convex nasal surface to the palate. Um, so you don't have this little channel that, that um, can allow air through. Um, but the question is how tight should they be? And I, I don't have a great answer to that. Um, my personal kind of practice is that I tighten them enough so that they don't lift away from the nasal side of the palate, but not so tight that they can still kind of move to the, to the posterior nasopharyngeal wall. So let's talk a little bit about kind of 
VPI and secondary palate surgery. So there's this term of VPI, which is kind of confusing in my mind, because what does it really mean? Does it really mean velopharyngeal incompetence? Does it mean velopharyngeal insufficiency or velopharyngeal inadequacy? And, and what do those three mean? Um, you know, there was this group of surgeons in the 1980s that decided to really coin these terms and published a paper, you know, with their definitions of what these three things were. But unfortunately, the speech pathologists decided that these were not the appropriate use of the terms and published their own paper a couple of years later with different definitions of what these terms mean. And so we're in this kind of confused literature of, of most people using the speech pathologist terms, but some people using the surgeon's terms. And I find it easier really to just use the term velopharyngeal dysfunction, which is a blanket term of, you know, any cause of inappropriate air escape through the nose when talking. So how do we determine whether a child has velopharyngeal dysfunction? Well, the gold standard is the perceptual evaluation by a trained listener, um, which is typically a speech pathologist in clinic. Um, but there can be some visible features that you can look for when you're assessing these kids. Um, the first is a facial grimace. And so this is a, a girl giving us an example of a facial grimace. And there are kind of three, three, you know, three classes in the classification of facial grimacing. There's just the ala, flaring of the ala, there's the whole of the nose, and then there's the, the extent up into the forehead and labella as well. The other thing you can do in clinic is to do a mirror test where you hold a mirror up in front of the nose, you get the kid to say sounds which should typically just be made in the mouth, and you see if there's any escape of air onto the mirror. And you can see a little bit of fogging up of the mirror when the kid's talking. But really the mainstay of what we do is kind of investigating this with speech imaging. Um, and the two main investigations we have are video fluoroscopy and nasendoscopy. I'm just gonna show a little clip from my website about these two studies. The speech imaging consists of two imaging studies. The first is lateral video fluoroscopy. This is an X-ray test in which we look at the palate moving from the side as the child talks. Here you can see a girl looking at some pictures to keep her head still during the study and the machine that takes the X-ray pictures as she is talking. If we go back to the side view of the middle of the face, which you'll remember, the images we get from fluoroscopy are very similar. You can see the hard palate between the mouth and the nose and the soft palate behind. If we now look at the soft palate as this child speaks, you will see that it lifts nicely, making good contact with the back of the throat. This is normal movement and is what I aim to achieve. Here are some examples of how this imaging can show problems with this valve system. Here is an example of touch closure, where the soft palate just about reaches the back of the throat, but not with enough force to act as an effective valve. Now, an example of a small consistent gap and a larger consistent gap. And finally, an example of a palate that really isn't moving well at all. The information from this study can help to show which type of surgery is most likely to help for the individual child. The other type of speech imaging is video nasendoscopy. In this study, a small camera is placed into the mouth and the nose, and we can see the soft palate moving directly. It gives us images like this. Going back to our familiar mid-facial diagram, the camera is about here, and it's looking at this area which means that on the picture, the back of the throat is at the top and the soft palate is at the bottom. If we look as a child speaks, you can see the soft palate lifting against the throat and making good contact. This is a normal movement pattern. Here is an example of a palate that is lifting but not making contact with a large gap. An example of a palate that is nearly making contact but has a consistent small gap. An example of a palate that is just about touching but doesn't have the force required to create a good valve system. You can see the bubbles as the air forces its way through the valve. 
This study is very helpful to show differences in palate movement between the right and left sides and to show the speech mechanism in patients who have had a pharyngeal flap. So those are the two kind of standard investigations that we do on pretty much all kids. You know, we won't, we won't necessarily do the nasendoscopy on the younger children who can't tolerate it, um, but it, it's good having both of those for, for most children that we're assessing. There are other ways of assessing the velopharyngeal mechanism. Um, there's nasometry, where you have a plate between the mouth and the nose. You have a microphone at the nose, a microphone in the mouth, and you see what the, kind of the, the amplitude of the sound coming out of both of those is during speech sounds. There is a pressure flow system where you can use um, you know, the, the flow equations to actually get a cross-sectional area of the velopharyngeal port during VPD. And we already mentioned Jamie Perry, but um, the dynamic MRI is becoming more and more popular. Um, and here's an example of you know, that that's mid-sagittal plane. And you can see with MRI that um, you can visualize the palate moving. So you've gone through all your investigations, you have the diagnosis of velopharyngeal dysfunction. So what operations do you offer? What can you offer? You know, some kids can't tolerate surgery and um, for other medical problems or for um, you know, psychosocial reasons. And you know, there is always the option of a speech bulb, which manually elevates the soft palate. Um, you know, we've already talked about furlough. Um, and you know, a furlough is a great option for certain circumstances. So it's a great option in my mind if the the location of the muscles and the palate is very anterior following palate repair um, that you can make the you can give those a more efficient position you can lengthen the palate um, and so for the right patient you know the 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 furlough really is kind of my my preferred operation for velopharyngeal dysfunction um, you know one criticism of a furlough in primary surgery is that you're eliminating this as an option for secondary speech surgery so you should do your straight line repair to start with that way you can do a furlough if the kid comes back with velopharyngeal dysfunction um, obviously professor Lowe has shown that it is safe and effective to repeat the double opposing zplasty for speech surgery and so you know, that that criticism has less weight now um you know, the pharyngeal flap is the most kind of traditional, most common speech surgery undertaken in the US at the moment. Um, the concept is that the palate is unable to lift adequately, it's unable to function to achieve velopharyngeal competence. And so you're creating this permanent tissue bridge between the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall. Um, the soft palate is split and you cut a section of the posterior pharynx on three sides you lift it up to meet the palate. Um, you suture the two structures together and line the back of the flap so that there's less contraction, less tubularization of the flap. Um, and you can see your know, cross section of the palate after the pharyngeal flap at the top left, showing this permanent bridge from the soft palate to the back of the pharynx. Um, on the right, you can see the appearance of that pharyngeal flap on nasendoscopy. Um, and these two holes at the side are the, what we call the ports, the openings left deliberately to avoid significant hyponasality and to allow breathing through the nose. Um, here's an example of how it works when the kid talks. And you see the lateral walls come in to close those ports. So the other most commonly used operation is a pharyngoplasty. In this operation, the soft palate still moves to create velopharyngeal closure, but the distance it needs to move is much reduced. It works through two main mechanisms. The first is a bulge created at the back of the throat, a bit like a speed bump. And the other is by reorientating the palate pharyngeus, it has a dynamic effect. It works as a sphincter wrapping around the velopharyngeal port. And so that both the back of the pharynx and the soft palate move to achieve velopharyngeal closure. It involves cutting the posterior tonsillar pillars on three sides, making a transverse incision between them, transposing those muscles so they overlap in the new incision. 
Um, and here's an example of how the palette moves um, to achieve that closure. And an example of a kid that I repaired with a pharyngoplasty. And you can see um, before the surgery, he has a relatively large gap. His palate is pretty short and there's no way that he's gonna make that contact. Um, and you can see after surgery that, you know, there's that bump on the posterior pharynx. You can see the palate is still lifting in the same way, but this time he's able to achieve velopharyngeal closure. So let's talk a little bit about kind of less commonly done techniques. So we talked about buckle flaps for primary palate surgery, but you can also use buckle flaps in secondary surgery. Um, so I think this is a really nice technique for when you have a good moving soft palate, but it's just too short and too scarred to ever achieve velopharyngeal closure. Um, what you do, you can see on the top left, you, um, you separate the soft palate from the back of the hard palate. You make a transverse incision all the way through the palate um, in front of where the muscles are. You move that soft palate back and typically it moves about a centimeter and a half back. It moves into a, a relaxed kind of natural position, um, which, which is significantly more posterior than it was before. Um, you then raise uh, the buccal mucosa together with a little strip of buccinator. Um, you take it down to that fascial plane above the buccal fat pad. Um, and you transpose that in the hole. And you know, I use two sides, I turn one down to act as the nasal layer, and then I, I rotate the other into the oral layer. Um, and you can see that, you know, that, that one and a half centimeters is pretty realistic in terms of what you can achieve. Um, and here's a kid, a kid that I treated with bilateral buckle flaps. And so you can see that preoperatively, again, he's got you know, a mobile palate, but he's got a pretty big gap. Um, he's only elevating about 50% of, of his uh, velopharyngeal gap. Um, and postoperatively, you can see that you know, you've got that chunky tissue and the palate is still lifting in the same way, but now because it's so much longer, it's able to make velopharyngeal closure. You know, something else that I will use in certain circumstances is fat grafting. And so the fat grafting has been described in the soft palate um, and in the posterior pharyngeal wall. And, his, and I only ever will use this in the soft palate and I'll talk about why. So you can see on the right, you've got this yellow hue of fat under the nasal surface of the soft palate. So I think this is a pretty good option for touch closure. And so I, I think it just doesn't work for larger gaps. I think it, the palate needs to be touching with, with a little bit of bubbling. Um, and you just put a small amount of fat, typically it's two to three cc's of fat. You put it on the nasal side of the soft palate and it acts just like a, a pillow on the nasal side of the palate to, to give you that last little bit of, of, of bulk to stop air coming out through the nose. So why don't I use it in the posterior pharynx? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that it has been described as being associated with obstructive sleep apnea, if you're narrowing down the airway by putting it in the back of the throat. And the second is because there are reports of kids who have had fat embolus into the carotid arteries. And there was a kind of famous case in the UK of a 17 year old girl who ended up with a massive like hemispheric stroke after fat injection to the posterior pharyngeal wall. Um, and that scares me. So here's an example of a kid that I treated with fat grafting. You can see, you know, on the left, he's got pretty good closure, but you can see that bubbling. You can see it's just incomplete. Um, and so, you know, I think this is really the only circumstance where I would use fat grafting in, in my algorithm. Um, and afterwards, you can see that, you know, there's not much difference in the movement, but that bubbling has stopped. And so that, that closure is now complete. So obviously we've gone through a lot of different surgeries and a lot of different options, but which one should you use? Um, you know, my philosophy is that I like to steer clear of operations that can cause airway obstruction. 
Um, you know, there was a multi-center, multi-country randomized controlled trial looking at uh, pharyngeal flap and pharyngoplasty um, and showing that there wasn't any difference between them. But the interesting part is what they found in terms of sleep apnea. So they found that just under 25% of kids having a pharyngeal flap will develop obstructive sleep apnea. Um, some of those will improve after, after a year, um, but about one in five will persist having OSA a year postoperatively. Pharyngoplasty is better. You know, it's about 15% soon after the surgery, going down to about 6% after a year, but these results are still pretty high. And we need to just think about obstructive sleep apnea for a minute. We've, we've said that, you know, 12 months after the surgery, the chance for the P-flap is about one in five, but the, the kid is not gonna stay the same shape and the same size through the whole of their life. You know, obviously we have a problem with obesity in, in America, but you know, we have about 10 to 20% of the population developing sleep apnea even without a cleft and with even without a pharyngeal flap. And so, you know, it could be one in five at the time of the surgery, but what's their risk when they're 40 years old? What's their risk when they're 60 years old? Are we really kind of setting these kids up to fail kind of later on in life because we're narrowing down their airways? And I just don't have an answer for you on that, but it's something to think about. Um, we do know that people with sleep apnea um, have higher risks of heart attacks, high, higher risk of stroke, higher risks of hypertension, higher risks of car accidents, higher risks of diabetes um, and insulin resistance. You know, it's hard to work out an all in lifetime mortality risk, but, you know, there are kind of published estimates showing kind of a 15 to 20 year reduction in lifespan for sleep, sleep apnea starting in childhood. Um, you know, obviously that that is very kind of poor evidence, but it's just something to think about when you're thinking about which speech surgery to use. So for those reasons, I use um, the operations that are not associated with um, sleep apnea whenever I can. So that will be a furlough, it'll be the palate lengthening with buckle flaps, it'll be fat grafting into the soft palate. And this is my overall algorithm of what I do when I'm evaluating a kid for velar pharyngeal dysfunction and you know, how that translates into the surgery that I like to offer. Um, well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, it was my pleasure talking to you this evening and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Seward, for the um, amazing presentation. I'm sure everyone had a blast listening to it. Now, um, before we go to um, our um, participants for the Q&A section, uh, I would like to invite our panelists for some comments. Now, first of all, I would like to invite Professor Chen, uh, Dr. Frank Cheng. Uh, thank you, Professor Siwu, for a very detailed, uh, detailed presentation of the entire uh, surgical technique and history of uh, paratoplasty. Uh, I, I can see that your uh, result will be very good. Uh, I, I do have one question, uh, two questions. First, do you use microscope uh, for all, the, all your patients? And second, uh, because uh, there's a, a period I, I, I suffer from the neck problem, so I use microscope for all operations. And uh, uh, I, I noticed that Dr. Soman, uh, he tried to identify laser palatin vessels uh, during his operation. Even I uh, Chang'e micro, uh, micro technique. It is very hard for me for uh, identify and uh, preserve all the uh, laser palatine vessel. Do you have any comment of that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, yes, I do use the microscope and um, I'll, I'll use it in different ways, depending whether I'm doing that, that straight line summer lad type repair or whether I'm doing a furlough. So, um, 
I, I like the microscope. I think that, you know, it gives you kind of pictures like I showed in my videos. Um, that's, you know, that's realistically what you see. Um, and um, I think that, you know, it helps me identify the levator separate from, from the palatopharyngeus and really helps me to get into that plane where, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about, you know, the blood supply to the nasal mucosa and, you know, I can really identify those muscles. In terms of the neck, I mean, it's it's a real problem for cleft surgeons. Um, you know, the 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 incidence of neck pain or even kind of you know anterior cervical fusions and things is is pretty high amongst cleft surgeons. And so I get around that in two ways. So firstly, I use the microscope for the muscle dissection. Um, I tend not to use it for the other parts of the repair. I tend not to use it to actually you do my suturing and put things together i tend not to use it for the hard palate um simply because i think that you know i find that i just need different views and i think setting up the microscope for different angles and different positions is is troublesome and awkward and um especially because i'm operating a lot with residents you know getting that visualization everywhere is is awkward with the microscope but i do use it for the muscle dissection what i have bought recently and i, I bought them last year are some uh prismatic loops and so they're loops where you can sit forwards but they have the angle within them and so so you can you can look down into the mouth but you can still have your neck in a in a neutral position and you can be looking forwards um, and so I, I would strongly recommend those to, to any cleft surgeon um, because, because otherwise, yeah, otherwise you are at risk of, of developing neck problems over time. Yeah, thank you. I have lab uh, uh, loop also, thank you. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you, Professor Cheng. Now, next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Fei Huang. Professor Huang. Hi, uh, Dr. Uh, Seward. It's very nice presentation. I have one question about uh, whether in uh, isolated cleft palates, would you prefer mm. doing some sort of procedure or would you do a furrow procedure? Because uh, since a lot of people believe or surgeon believe that a uh, furrow peritoplasty probably will reduce the rate of uh, VPD dysfunction. Or um, I think some of the procedure probably would do same way as um, furrow peritoplasty when you were doing an uh, isolated clip palate repair. What is your suggestions? So, so I've changed over kind of the 10 years that I've been in practice. You know, I, I came into my practice really with the summer lad philosophy of doing straight repair whenever you can. But I, I do a primary furlough now for the, you know, isolated and narrow cleft palate. So the way I make my decision on that is, you know, because of the Z-plasty concept that you need that lateral laxity to be able to achieve lengthening, I need to know that, you know, my, my z plasties are going to reach before I, I make those cuts and commit to a z plasty. Right. The way I do that is when I'm infiltrating with local anesthesia, um, before I make any markings and before I make any cuts, what I will do is I'll inject along the cleft margin with local anesthetic. And I, I typically use, you know, quarter percent bupivacaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine. And I'll inject that along the palatal edge and the palate will kind of expand and blow up. And really, if the two edges come to the point where they're kissing and touching just with the local anesthetic, then I will do a, a primary furlough. I'll do a primary z -plasty. If I still have a gap between those, then I'm kind of too scared to do a primary furlough in that situation because I don't, you know, I haven't used these fat flaps. I, I haven't got the confidence that, you know, if that flap doesn't reach, then I'm not going to do harm. And so in that situation, I'll, I'll do a straight line repair. That, that's my kind of decision process for, you know, clefts of the, of the soft palate and just the very back of the hard palate. Yeah. Oh yeah. And sorry, I was, I, I mentioned in the lot, in the previous question that, you know, I also use the microscope for the furlough. Um, and I get the microscope in right at the beginning and I'll, do, I'll elevate the four flaps using the microscope and then I get the scope out. I do the muscle repair and, and 
suture everything else with these kind of prismatic loops. Um, would you worry about uh, later on if there's an obstructive step apnea after if you do fluoroplatoplasty? Uh, since you lengthening the the soft part and also you thickening the the uh, AP or the the muscle over the the um, the the um, the VP area. So later mm. on, would you worry if you do furrow on the primary cases, would they cause obstructive sleep apnea? Is there any problems? So I heard. I, you know, I'm not aware of, you know, a double opposing Z plus or a furrow, you know, being a, a contributing factor for sleep apnea. Um, you know, I, I have it in kind of in my category of kind of one of the safe operations for sleep apnea. And so, so yes, you are lengthening the palate, but you're length, you're not lengthening it, you know, immediately posteriorly, you know, it lengthens a little bit down and back where the airway is still open. Um, and it's, you know, hopefully by breaking up the scar, you're, you're keeping the palate relatively soft and supple where it's not going to be this rigid structure that's narrowing down the airway. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know for sure that not hurting any of the kids that I'm treating that way. Um, you know, it's it's difficult when you've got this kind of this eventual population base of 10 to 20 percent of people that get sleep apnea. You know, how much of that is me? I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, ben Lai, Professor Lai. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seawood. You give us a very uh, good talk uh, and very detailed about uh, the technique and the uh, strategy to do the uh, crab palate repair. And well, actually I, I use the uh, many kinds of a technique to do my primary uh, crab palate uh, repair and even the, the secondary BPI surgery. Uh, I have a question about the, the, do you think which is the most important things to achieve the adequate BP function? Is the lens or the muscle function? Because I think uh, for experienced doctor, I mean the experienced crab surgeon, we can really uh, dissect the muscle, repair the muscle, and even use the double opposing Z prosty to lengthen the soap palate. I think up to now, as I know, no one can guarantee the uh, BP adequate. So what's the problem? Do you have any idea about that? You know, I, I think you've touched on something kind of very important that we have all these different techniques and um, we, we don't have kind of a consensus of, of what aspects are the most important. You know, I, in my mind, you know, there are three outcomes from palate surgery. There's the speech, there's the growth and the fistula rates. Um, and, you know, just concentrating on speech, it seems that there are a few groups around the world who have got velopharyngeal rates down to, you know, 5% or less. And those groups are, you know, some lad in the UK, and he does a straight line repair. Um, your group, uh, you know, Changong, um, and you do a double opposing z plasty often. And at the Bob Mann group, and he does his primary buckle flaps. And so it seems that you can achieve these great speech outcomes in different ways. And, you know, when Eurocleft was looking at these different centers and different people with, you know, comparing each individual surgeon's protocol versus a standard protocol, really the outcome that was most important was the surgeon not the technique. Um, 
And, and so, you know, I think a lot of it is based on, you know, how you handle the tissues, you know, how much you dissect the muscle, how, and, and how you put things together more so than maybe the technique itself. But there's also no point having a technique that one person in the world can do and no one can copy because ultimately you're not going to be able to treat everyone in the world. Um, and so the question is, which of these techniques is most applicable for an average surgeon rather than a fantastic surgeon? And I'm not sure we have the answer to that. You know, I think that there are advantages to the double opposing z plasty that, you know, break up the scar and, you know, maybe less muscle handling is better for someone who isn't absolutely experienced in muscle handling. Um, but, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to give you a definite answer today, unfortunately. I mean, you know, people will criticize what I do with the muscle. You know, I do much more dissection than most people in terms of like getting under the levator, separating the levator a little bit from the other muscles. And, you know, I think about it in terms of I'm achieving more mobilization of the muscles so that are good, but am I creating more scar around the muscle, which is bad? Um, and I, I don't have the answer to that in terms of, you know, how much mobilization is good, how much scar is bad, what, where that kind of fine balance is between helping and hurting the patient. I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts on it if, if, if you have them. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Uh, you know, it, I think about this for, I think uh, almost uh, 20 something, because in my career is almost uh, 30 years and it's really a difficult problem to answer. And I try, I measure the length, but I cannot find a, a magic number to tell because uh, uh, the soft palate is at least ratio, such as uh, uh, we define it short. So I need to lengthen it. No way. Up to now, although I have um, tried to start it, but really diff difficult to get a definite number, a magic number, say, yes, we need to lengthen the soap palette to this extent, and then we can get the VT function well. Right, right. So that's a problem. And I, from your presentation, I found your muscle repair. Uh, it's a kind of a, in my mind, it's a kind of an end-to-end -end repair, right? It's yes. not truly really a, a, a overlapping repair. It is. It's it's a deliberate end-to-end -end repair um, because I like getting that little bit of bunching in the middle, um, so that so that the nasal surface, if the palate is a little bit convex. Um, rather than concave, because sometimes you'll find if you have it concave, then there'll be a little groove that air can escape through and you get bubbling through that. And so that, that little bit of bunching with the redundant muscle hopefully eliminates that. Hopefully. Yeah, I also do the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the Wu say he can uh, dissect the uh, levator muscle and uh, suture them with four small suture. I really wonder how can he do it? I, I worry that if you dissect that much, you're eliminating kind of the fascia around it, which, because, you know, we know that if you put stitches, you know, a simple stitch through the muscle in the line of the fibers, it can pull through those fibers. And so, you know, I like to have that, that, that connection with the palatopharyngeus. I like to have that connection with the aponeurosis so that, at least one of my stitches is into something super solid, even every, even if everything else pulls through. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation and uh, uh, the answer in my question. Of course. I think we have a lot of things can discuss about this, uh, especially in the uh, secondary uh, VP surgery. Yeah. Mm. We can find time to discuss this. Thank you. I would like it, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lai. Now, uh, for the last but not least of our panelists, I'd like to invite Professor Lo. Uh, hi, Dr. Seward. I'd like to uh, enjoy your talk uh, very much. Uh, well, thank uh, you. 
very comprehensive. And uh, I do wish to uh, add one comment that yes. uh, we that we just uh, that that we just talk about the uh, why we do uh, so uh, that why we do so much uh, operations still we see patient with BPI. Uh, you, I think your comment is right that uh, uh, maybe a very important factor is the uh, uh, experience, you know, a very good experience, senior surgeon probably have better uh, B, uh, BP competence rate. I think uh, the other thing maybe in, in, in my thought is the intrinsic deficiency that you know, when crap happened, uh, there must be some uh, intrinsic uh, deficiency in the lip, the same in the palate should be the same. Uh, so whatever uh, we do uh, to make it right, still you have some, uh, you know, a small percentage of patient that, that could get VPI so that we do the surgery again. Mm. So the, uh, this is the, the first uh, issue. The second issue is, is that uh, you talk about the neck issue that uh, in our audience, maybe many of you are crest surgeon and some years later, you may start to get a neck, neck problem. There are uh, already several uh, colleagues in my cranial facial team have neck problem and even got surgery. Uh, uh, I think maybe one of the solution in addition to your microscope or like, uh, 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 you know, this uh, curve uh, uh, operating loop, uh, maybe that uh, you, you, you go to right bicycle that, go, if you right bicycle, you have to uh, extend your neck upward, okay? And uh, you do surgery, you need to bend down your neck. So maybe that, that's a, a good exercise for, uh, for, uh, for the surgeon who, uh, you know, keep doing uh, crest surgery. Uh, this is my comment, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have an answer about you know how, exactly how we can best avoid the the neck issues. I think that, you know, I think any excuse to get on a bicycle is is a good one. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor Lowe. Um, so, due to the amazing lecture, I think uh, our chat is full of like overfilled with questions from the audience. Now we oh, won't wow. get through okay. all of them, but we'll try to get through as much as possible. So um, our first question is a question from Dr. Honda and he'd like to ask you, how do you manage feeding after palatoplasty? So, um, you know, we have, we have great speech pathologists who help us a lot with feeding, but my, my philosophy is that kids will recover fastest and recover best going straight back to what they normally use and what they're used to using. And so, so I, I don't have a problem with kids going straight back to a bottle on the day of the surgery. Um, I, I always say that, you know, in theory, you've needed this cleft feeding device for nine months and now, you know, we've prepared your palate and you shouldn't need it anymore. But, but I always say that, you know, the first few weeks after the surgery is not the time to change anything. Just go back to what the kids are using, how they're used to feeding. And, you know, we try and keep the, the bottle as central as possible. We try not to use kind of syringe feeding and, and, and catheters because, um, you know, our speech pathologists are very you know, strong minded about the fact that that kind of delays um, feeding and, and recovery to, to regular bottles. Um, but, but really what, we'll, what we recommend is just go straight back to what you've been using before. Okay, um, and our, for our second part of our question, it's a two-part question from Dr. Kamajaja, and he'd like to ask you um, for the first question, for hard palate repairs, do you consider using a VY pushback or has it become outdated? So I, I've, yeah, maybe I'm dating myself, but I've, I've never seen a VY pushback. I've never done one. Um, you know, it was, it was very much kind of frowned upon when I was training in the UK as something that kind of exposes anterior bone that leads to significant problems with maxillary growth. Um, you know, it, it obviously has potential advantages in terms of soft palate length, 
um, but at, at the expense of, of maxillary growth. And so in my mind, it's, it, it is really an operation that's kind of confined to, to history because of growth issues. Um, you know, I think we have we have other alternatives now and we have you know, better alternatives. And, you know, maybe maybe with the advent of you know, buckle fat, you know, when, if you can line it, maybe it, it, it's not necessarily confined to history if, if you can avoid that exposed bone. Um, but it's it's not something that's ever been in in my repertoire or in my radar. And the second part of his question is um, how essential is the uvula reconstruction? in speech after secondary cleft palate repairs, or should we choose VPD repairs using uh, pharyngeal flaps or other indicated techniques? So in my mind, you know, the uvula has no role in speech. Basically the palate behind the muscles really has no role in speech. You know, the, the palate needs to lift where the muscles are and make contact where the muscles are against the, the posterior nasopharynx. Um, and anything behind that is basically aesthetic. Um, that's how I think about it. Now, in the normal palate, in the non-cleft situation, obviously there is a uvula and there's a muscle that goes to that uvula, which, which basically extends the palate a little bit, the muscularis uvulae. And you know, there are groups that present it, you know, then the cleft meetings that do computer modeling on, on all the soft palate muscles. And they, and they say that, you know, it decreases the force that levator needs to exert in order to achieve belopharyngeal competence. So maybe I'm wrong about the fact that it's purely aesthetic, but I think in the cleft situation, we can basically not worry too much about the uvula. Having said that, parents really worry about the uvula. Um, and, you know, I've had so many parents that are basically, you know, they're really upset about the fact that the uvula is small, as it often is after a palate repair, or that, you know, that we've had a tiny little bit of dehiscence at the uvula and the rest of the palate is intact, but, but they think of it as a disaster because the uvula has come apart. Um, and so, you know, I think kind of educating parents is important in terms of expectations and consequences, but, you know, I, I don't worry too much about the uvula. Thank you. And uh, our next question is from Dr. Vitaly Dewey. And um, the question is, um, during what age could you do the VPI correction surgery in order to achieve a good result for speech? You know, I think that, um, again, that, that's kind of open for debate. Mm -hmm. um, my philosophy is that, you know, as a consequence to VPI, most kids will develop some compensatory articulation errors. And the younger those kids are, the easier it is to correct those compensatory articulation errors. So in my mind, you, know, you should do the VPI surgery as soon as you've identified it. Um, and I don't really see the benefit to waiting, but there are others who will advocate waiting. You know, particularly Bob Mann, he says he doesn't do any VPI surgery until about the age of seven because he's seen VPI correct itself up to the age of seven. And if it persists after that, then he'll repair it. You know, I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. I think that, you know, I haven't really noticed VPI resolve unless it's like phoneme specific VPI that can be targeted with speech therapy. But if it's, if it's a mechanical problem with VPI, typically that's something that persists over time. And I tend to repair it as soon as I've identified that there's definitely a problem. But of course, the age where you identify it varies from kid to kid, because there are certain kids that don't tolerate the speech imaging, or their, their articulation is so bad that you can't reliably get adequate speech imaging. Um, and, and so the age that you can do effective speech imaging will change. And um... The next question is, what is the source of fat graft that you use for your VPI correction surgery? So you can basically use it from anywhere. Um, you know, typically I will harvest from the abdomen. Um, typically I'll make a little stab incision with a 15 blade just within the umbilical hood. Um, and, you know, I will harvest from the two sides of the abdomen. And, and ultimately, you know, I'm injecting like three cc's of fat. Um, and so, you know, I'm harvesting probably, you know, five, six cc's of kind of lipoaspirate with, with some, you know, infiltration fluid. 
And you can generally get that from, you know, even the thinnest kids will give you a couple of CCs for each side. Um, you know, there are, there are techniques that we use for larger fat grafts where we um, will go to the inferior gluteal crease and actually excise a block of tissue and, and scrape that fat off and use that for fat injection. But I've never needed to use that for velar fat grafting. I, I typically will use it from the abdomen. And our next question is from Dr. Nara. Um, could, can you please give us any tips for harvesting petticoat buckle fat pad? Because um, the, um, well, the author wrote that um, they use those quite often, but they often notice that in a few children, it would look dry and desiccated on day two or three. Okay, so I, I don't really feel that I want to comment on buckle fat because it's something I've never used yet. You know, I wanted to include it in the talk because I think it's important to, to discuss as cleft surgeons. And, you know, I know this group is, is using it and has published on it pretty extensively. Um, but it's not something that I've, I've ever done. And so I, I wouldn't really want to comment on that. But I'm happy to, to hear about it from others if, if you'd like to comment. Then maybe um, I can invite Professor Lowe to give a comment on this topic. Are you talking about the buckle fat? Yes, uh, the pedicle buckle fat. <clears throat> uh, well, we use pedicle buckle fat mainly to uh, to cover the raw surface after the relaxing incision. And uh, uh, I think it's not difficult to harvest since that uh, we, we, we open the uh, just lateral mucosa a little bit and then uh, we uh, I mean, just elevate the lateral mucosa, and then we can find the bucinata muscle and uh, use the uh, the, the plantive scissors to make a perforation, and then the buckle fat will come out, and then uh, we, uh, you know, just cover the raw surface, but we need to uh, to stabilize the buckle fat. I think the buckle fat is really uh, useful in in many way uh, in primary pie repair. Uh, uh, covering the, the raw surface, or even you can put in the anterior soft palate, uh, because uh, when you do the double potency, Z, uh, the anterior part of the soft palate actually is quite empty. Uh, it's like a dead space there. So if you can use the buckle fat to cover the, uh, the, the, the space, uh, it will promote healing. And uh, sometimes the nasal side mucosa cannot be securely uh, closed uh, in, in the uh, unilateral or bilateral crack, then that, that buckle fat can also provide some, uh, some support. So uh, 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 in your presentation, you show uh, we have various uh, application of the buckle fat pad, the paper buckle fat pad is, is quite helpful. But Professor Lo, um, the audience is asking um, when they harvest the pedicle pad, buckle fat pad, they would notice that it would turn a little bit dry and desiccated like two or three days later. Is there a way to prevent that? Two or three days later will become dry. Uh, it's it actually not my observation. You can, uh, if, if two or three days later, even one, one week later, if you still see the buckle fat, uh, it, it turns pink, pinkish and gradually, gradually disappear. And then the mucosa uh, regeneration will, will again line the, over the, the, the area. So uh, I didn't see, uh, you know, a dry out, uh, you know, of the buckle fat. Um, and do um, Professor Lai or Professor Huang or Professor Chang want to give an additional comment on this? No, I don't have. Uh, I don't have experience to use the medical. Okay. Um. Then I guess we'll go to our next question, and our next question is: Um, when you do palatoplasty after the an interior palatal closure with lip repair, do you find it to be difficult in elevating the palatal uh, mucoperiosteum in the hard palate where the anterior palate is closed? Um, it can be. So, so typically it, it, 
typically it's not hard to elevate the um so it's typically not hard to elevate the palate muca periosteum the difficulty is is landing on the palate the palatal shelf um we need to obviously you need to make your incision you need to make your incision down to bone so you can get under that periosteum and lift it up and sometimes you know at that very back part where you've done the voma flap and you repaired it you know you have scar and you have tissue that's kind of remucosalized and it can be hard to work out exactly kind of where the edge of the bone is and land your knife so that it lands on that edge of bone and you're not just making a cut down into the nose and creating a hole and a problem um and you know I do a lot of surgery with residents and that's one of the the hardest things for me to teach the residents is like how to get that knife to land on that edge of bone because the way I do it is just going to feel it and I work out the angle that I'm going to need to cut out and I, I make that cut at, the, at that angle but it is a it is a source of like stress when I'm operating with residents that you know they're not going to get it right and suddenly they're going to plunge into the nose and I'm going to have to like repair something else that that they've done um, but I think once you're on that palatal shelf typically that 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 shelf elevates pretty nicely, even after the even after the Voma flap. It's just getting on that shelf that can be troublesome sometimes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, juniors, for your wonderful moderating for all this quick AQA for Professor Seward. I think time is limited uh, because we have more and more questions should be answered by James, but uh, I think we have no more time. Hopefully, probably we can have a. Uh, uh, more time to invite you for the second time here. Give a, a small well, information. Yeah, I, but, I would uh, love to. <laughs> yes. And now we have some uh, activity of the Chang'an Korean official team to announce. Okay, the first of all, I will introduce the further two more uh, the lectures in ICC, and the Professor Frank Chum will introduce uh, this year the annually Chang'an Forum here with our very fabulous uh, programs for all our participants here. So first of all, I would like to introduce the two weeks. Uh, we will share our new article in PRS. Uh, today, James already cited in his presentation. This topic will be presented by Professor uh, Chi Chun Lo to show how to use in the buckle fat flap to cover in the lateral row surface and uh, we do to evaluate to further the outcome, uh, but especially focusing on the maxillary widening or maxillary development uh, when the children grow up. And uh, one week later in August 7th, that is one of our series of the pre-Congress of the Chang'an Forum. And we focus on the clap orthodontics, just like today. Today, the topic is for the part of plasty. And that time we invited uh, Professor Maria Costana Mezzelli uh, to give us a very special lecture for the orthodontics. And then I uh, will introduce the Professor Frank Chang here and uh, to give us uh, what is our program of the Chang'an Forum this year? Professor Frank Chang, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Xi Wu for the presentation and thank you, uh, Bang Yu. Uh, I would like to invite everyone here uh, to join our 12th international workshop in Kedi Palais and Craniofacial Anomalies. And this year, many presentation were like uh, uh, like uh, uh, the presentation given by uh, Dr. Si Wood today that were combined with the presentation and the show video to detail the the, the procedures. So uh, if you are interested, please please uh, preserve your date. The date will be uh, October 29th and the 30th. And uh, all of you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Frank Chum. And uh, yeah, where well, I would like to invite all of you to show you a beautiful smile in front of the computer, in front of the screen. It's the most important time. That is group photo. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, today is very invaluable to, to have the photo with the gems. Okay, I saw a lot of our old friend. Hello, Rafael. Yeah, 
Hello, Professor Handa. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Dr. Timola. Okay, I will count to three and uh, please uh, remain your smile uh, and uh, here. So one, two, cheese. Great. I mean, I have one more and uh, probably you can give me a heart or give me a sum up. Uh -huh. So one, two, cheese. Okay, thank you, my friend. Good morning and good evening, and uh, looking forward to your uh, next time to participation. Uh, two weeks later, see you again. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very James. much. Bye-bye. Thank you, our Thank panelists. You. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Stay on tune in the Facebook with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, bye. Bye. Thank you, James. Thank you, Junior. Hard work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.